You've reached the stars. Now let's see you conquer galaxies. The storm is over. Is it? Is it ever over? Storms are part of life. They come and go. The plan is to build your wealth, to withstand stormy days. And to do that, you need partners. Partners that understand what it means to build wealth that lasts. Meristam, let's grow wealth for you. Yes, I just paid my children's school fees. Supposed to buy some shares today, but it's school fees season, you know. But just like school fees, stocks cannot wait. Life's nice many responsibilities come with its sacrifices. But with a margin lending facility, you don't have to miss out on your investment opportunities. Now you can buy shares even when you are not with it. All you need to do is have existing shares, managed funds, or cash to be used as collateral. The margin of the stocks should be calculated to determine how much you can get to buy new stocks. Remember, there is no investment without risk. The time and stocks wait for no one. Don't imagine what can be. Let the Maristan Margin Lending help us to investment portfolio. Terms and conditions apply. Call 0700 Maristan now to get started. Maristan, let's take you further. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for attending this webinar. On behalf of Mary Stem, I welcome you. And I say that we hope that you'll be able to enjoy this webinar and learn and take away the salient points of the webinar. Um, with me today, I am Uluwake Miomuni. With me moderating the webinar today is my colleague, George Anigunim. And to do justice to today's topic, which is real estate investing and legal intricacies, we have with us Mrs. Tosin Ajose. Welcome, Tosin. Thank you for joining us. She Good is the morning. lead partner and um, lead advice for Deal HQ at the Deal HQ. Um, and also with us is Mr. Babajide Okusaga, who is the chairman of Book Trust. Welcome, Bosun. Thank you for joining Thank us. You. Today we'll be talking about real estate investments and the legal intricacies surrounding them. We know that the real estate market space for Nigeria is not as structured as we have in other countries. In fact, when you mention things like advisory, like portfolio rebalancing in real estate, people wonder what you're talking about. Um, but what, in actual fact, we should give real estate the same attention we give to other asset classes. And by virtue of being a wealth management firm, Meristem has been in contact with a lot of clients, HNIs, uh, mass affluent clients who have real estate as a major part of their portfolios. And we've seen a lot of experiences, things that you know, could have been avoided at the, reg at the steps that should have been taken at the outset being taken, um, problems that could have been avoided. And it is because of this that we, um, took the initiative to have this session so that we can educate and have people know what the areas they should focus on in terms of real estate when investing, the key things they should be looking at and the minor things that people often ignore or look away from that shouldn't be, that could um, cause problems in the future. And um, today we'll be talking about the basics of investing. We'll be talking about established investments. We'll be talking about the legal issues um, surrounding the real estate market space. Thankfully, um, the, the legal state government in, um, in conjunction with key professionals in the real estate market space are working um, hard to ensure that there's some structure to real estate investments in Nigeria and in Lagos state particularly. We, we hope that a lot of the plans that have been set in motion uh, will come to fruition very soon and we can have more structure. I'm asking about your experiences. I'm talking, talking about the structure of real estate in Nigeria, uh, the kind of ugly experiences that people have when making real estate investments. Do you think it's really worth it at all in your experience, um, the situations that you've had to deal with? Okay. Do you think it's even worth it at all? You see, it, it, 
with investment. I, 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 I get what you ask. I get your, your question now. Real estate is still the best form of investments. And I think it worth it a lot. Especially now when the um the interest rates of the banks the, that they give for fixed deposits is now between one and three percent. Um we've also seen that the treasury bill is is at its lowest. That is the reality. So we are all forced to do business, and the easiest kind of business, the kind of the investor you can do, that makes you look as if you are doing your own business, but it's also passive. So when you say passive income, is you are only talking about real estate. But you have to have some level of intelligence to be able to manage it to get good returns. So you can actually spend money on real estate or invest in real estate. So, but the, the problem in Nigeria is that we are, there are three levels in real estate, whereby you build for the purpose of um, an architectural masterpiece, or you be for basic shelter, I want the house for me and my family. Then the third level is I want to build the house, sleep there, and also still make money from it. So we have to also be clear. Are you trying to, there are four pieces I tell people. Are you trying to invest because of your parents, because of profitability, because of popularity or pride? So most instances, you see people are investing in real estate just because my, your parents are asking you, what are you, have you built your own house? So they don't care, they just do something for my parents. Some are doing for pride, let me say I have my own site. Some people are doing for popularity, so let me say I have a property or one place and they will buy invest. But I do for profit, every detail counts. So you cannot say it's not profitable when you went into it for emotional reasons, which is parents, popularity and pride are majorly emotional reasons. And when emotion is high, logic is low. So but when you want to make profit, from real estate, you must be very logical. You do your inspection thoroughly, you, are, you, you make use of professionals in making decisions, make sure you pay them appropriately because the numbers count. So there's still a lot of good returns. For example, we bought a property at 35 million in October. Somebody else had exited at 45 in February. So there's still transactions like that, but you cannot see it if you are not in the market. And you don't forget, it is only real estate that you have to use an agent to buy. Why? Nothing but the complexity of the title. The bundle of rights are complex. So they say, don't go there yourself. Make sure you use somebody that is specialized, specialized in that thing, that understands it. So a lot of people, and two, we call the other issue why it, it, it looks as if it's not profitable because it is, is that we have a lot of dead assets. I saw a statistic, they say we have over 900 billion in dead assets in Nigeria. PW say all the money we are looking for in foreign direct investments are already in Nigeria and they are in real estate. Lastly, I tell people, you say you go and buy a property, you not document, you not perfect the title. It's like you say you go and invest in a company, you sign the CAC document and put it to your draft and say you're a director in that company. You're not a director. CAC does not know you. When they do a they won't see you there. So when, when they are trying to sell their shares, you can't sell yours. So those are things, so real estate is a very, very, it's one of the best, Nigeria is a very, very fat girl. Why? We have a deficit of 20 million or 70 million, depending on who you are putting. So there will always be demand for real estate and there will always be chance to make spread. But we need to make logical and intelligent decisions to be able to make us this money. Thank you. Thank you for that, Mr. Kusaga. I had to ask um, for your experience. Uh, Mr. Kusaga is the managing director I'm sorry, the chairman of Bob Trust is works in the past as the managing director of Moplant Property. He's, um, he also proceeded to become the managing director of Okusaga, Babajide Okusaga and Company, and before he became the chairman and CEO of Bob Trust Property. Bob Trust also has a microfinance, property, a microfinance bank um, on whose board he sits, and is also presently the board on the board of liberal investment as well. Mr. Okusaga has is, is had over 15 years of experience in the real estate market space, which is why I ha we had to you know, ask him to give in his opinion in his, um, brief, in his, brief ex in his experience to give in brief um, his, his insights into the real estate investing space and whether or not it's, it's really even makes sense to go into real estate investment regardless of all of the um, issues that one has to navigate in investments. 
Thank you for that, Mr. Okusaga. Ms. Ms. Jose, what, what would you say in your experience is the most important thing, legally speaking, that one should consider when dealing in real estate? Okay, thank you, Kemi. Um, let, me, let me contribute to the last um, question, first of all, before I um, take this one that you've asked me. So um, I advise in the real estate space and um, I agree with Mr. Okusaga um, on a high level. Broadly, I agree, you know, that real estate would always be, you know, a good investment because it's, is able to you know, deliver returns on two legs. You are able to earn um, rental income, and then you're also you know, open to exposure on capital appreciation, which you know, not a lot of um, you know, other assets can promise. And generally we know that uh, real estate is a store of wealth. From time immemorial, it's impossible to um, measure wealth without any, you know, reference to real estate. In fact, one of the defining differences between bourgeoisies and proletariats in the early days is access to real estate. So that's, you know, um, a, a good way to start. However, in recent times, Nigeria has become a very peculiar market for real estate. And if yourself having exposure to um, assets within this country. Many times when you benchmark your investments to more stable currencies like the USD, you will find that you know, it's harder to answer the question whether real estate is actually profitable or not. You know, because you will be earning returns if you benchmark your investment amount to USD at the time when you made the investment, and you compare, you know, asset value and return over the years with the um, current value of money you know, at today's price in more stable currencies. Many people might find that, you know, many of the assets they are carrying are actually, you know, being carried at a negative value. So, I mean, while broadly I agree that, you know, it's good, you know, these um, real estate investments and that it is not only good, it is expedient, but I think, you know, these days the, the, the odds are, you know, quite, you know, speaking a different, you know, creating a different picture and speaking a different language from what we've always known. So, I mean, it, 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 it's, it's more a fiscal policy thing, but it's also, you know, good that we mention that there is some value depreciation on account of our economy and the, the instability in our currency. So to go to your, your question around um, the key things to consider when making real estate investments, I will focus generally on legal issues. I will talk broadly on you know, a few things that I think that people need to be minded about when they are considering making investments. So you would hear a lot of people say that the first rule in real estate is location, location, location. So I will start by saying location. But location is relative to um, the objective of your investment. And I think Mr. Kusaga spoke a lot about that. Sometimes people are investing for different reasons. If you are investing for um, returns, you need to consider location. If you are if you are investing for pride and other emotional reasons, you also have to consider location. So I would say location one. Um, the second thing I think you need to be minded about is valuation. What is the actual value of the asset that you are buying at the time that you are going in so that you can appropriately price your investment? And broadly, two things that you should consider when talking about valuation is what is the market value of a property of that size in the location where it is. The other angle that a lot of people do not consider is the remainder of the interest on the title. So if I buy a property in Banana Island and the owner had 99 years and the 99 years expires in 2025, should I pay 
the same value as one that the COO was issued in 2019? Obviously not. So in determining valuation, you need to also be minded about the remainder of the term on the title. Um, the third thing you need to be minded about is the quality of the title. So what am I getting? What is the interest that would devolve to me when I buy the asset? Is it good title? And what is good title? So it's professionals like us that can tell you what good title is. And so I think also Mr. Okusaga had spoken, you know, when he, when he was uh, first question around ensuring that you get professional advice. So I've heard, I mean, I've had the most, you know, ridiculous questions around title. I have heard somebody tell me that uh, the title is that they have a survey. When you say what title do they have, somebody will say they have survey. <laughs> and you're like, what, 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 what's the plan? So you need to establish the root of the title and be sure that there is actually a legal interest that can be transferred to you when you close the sale. Another thing, if you are buying real estate is structural integrity, especially if you are buying a built up property. It's not just enough to establish title. If it is built up, does it have structural integrity? How long can you actually enjoy the benefit of that property when you buy it? There are many people in Nigeria that have bought properties that, um, especially from developers, so they are doing a scheme, they build one um, three bedroom house somewhere and okay, you've checked the title, title is fine. And then you decide to make the investment. You move into the house, the roof is leaking. You move into the house, the, the um, septic tank is leaking into the water system. You know, there are many things that make, you know, a property, you know, have value. And a lot of times we forget to check structural integrity. If it is land, same thing. Is it waterlogged? Where is it? If you are buying in one of these places that have not, you know, that are not fully developed, would you clear and check what the site actually looks like? You know, those are some of the things because if you buy property and you're not expecting that you would have to do a raft foundation and then you want to start building and you realize that you have to sink another 10 million to get the foundation off the ground. I mean, it just uh, continue, um, completely changes the dynamics of your investments. And um, the final thing you need to consider is use. What do you want to use the property for? If it is um, you want to hold to sell and you're a speculative buyer, maybe it doesn't matter. If you're not a speculative buyer and you want to you want to buy to develop or you are buying a built-up property, what do you want to use it for? Does it align with the approved use? So they are planning regulations in every location. And usually you have different areas earmarked for different things. Some areas you will buy land and the, the, the land is, has been um, earmarked for agricultural purpose. And you are looking to build a warehouse. You don't check the title, you don't do a plan, you don't check, you don't get planning information, you go and buy that property. One day you will build something on it and government will, and you know, you know how it is, regulators will never come to you when you are starting the project. They let you finish. And then somebody will knock on your door and say, you have to come and visit us at the Ministry of Agriculture. This land, is, this land belongs to Ministry of Agriculture. And then you start a whole round of legal battle. So I think in essence, these are just a few things that um, people need to, need to consider when you're, when, you're, when you're talking real estate investing. Thank you for that, Mr. Joseph. Um, Thank you for the robust answer. Mrs. Ajoste is, like I said earlier, she's a partner and the lead advisor at Deal HQ Partners. Deal HQ Partners is an African-focused transaction advisory firm in Lagos. Um, from her answer, you can see that she's not just any lawyer. She's very well versed in the real estate sector. She was recognized at Niger Nigerian Legal Awards as one of the 40 under 40 years in Nigeria in 2018. She also works with the Central Bank of Nigeria um, she, she's worked with them as a legal, legal enabler under the CBN Nigeria FSS 2020 initiative. She's also a professional member of the Nigerian Housing Finance Program as well. 
She's an adjunct faculty. She's a member of the adjunct faculty of Center of Housing Studies at the University of Lagos as well. So she very well knows our onions in the real estate sector. Thank you again, Mr. Jose, for that robust answer. Um, one of the reasons why people, when they invest, it, like you mentioned, a lot of people don't consider, um, especially the interest in land when they are purchasing. And sometimes they don't even know the level of due diligence that they should do. In fact, most people would buy properties and not even change the title because they believe that it's, it's a cumbersome process or why would they invest so much in changing property titles when they would be losing yield. They see it as losing yield, forgetting that if there's ever any problem that arises as a result of not changing their title in future, they will be further losing much more money um, in the process. As we proceed in the session, we'll be bringing up situations, real life situations um, and experiences of clients, prospects, people that we've interacted in system with, situations that we have, um, we have evolved ourselves in trying to resolve and what happened in these situations. And we'll have our seasoned professionals with us, Mrs. Ajose and Mr. Kusaga, tell us what are the key things that should have been done that would have prevented such situations and what are the things that also, in not preventing that situation, the situation has now crystallized. What are the things that should be done um, to resolve this? I will now hand over to my co-moderator, George, um, to take us through the next session on these experiences, and then we can engage our, our panelists on what should be done in those situations. OK, thank you so much, uh, Kemi. And good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I also want to appreciate uh, Mr. Babajide and uh, Mr. Uh, Ms. Tosi, Mrs. Tosi and uh, Jose. Thank you so much for those elaborate um, explanations. You know, Mr. Babajide made mention of something very striking, that one of the reasons why people want to invest in real estate is because they want to take pride. They're just bringing emotions, so much emotions into it, saying, oh, that property between um, Lekki and Suso Place, I own it. Not just looking at the monetary aspect of it or the value they stand to derive. And I think this is the major reason why we have a lot of people play in the real estate team, in Nigeria mostly, but with little or no knowledge. And because of this, a lot of people have um, had their fingers burned over the years. Um, one of these ex examples, one of my clients who worked in one of the international oil companies uh, some years ago in Port Harcourt, he invested in one massive um, uh, property there in Port Harcourt. But after some years, he decided to sell up because he needed money to do some other things um, right away. And for the past three years, that property has been in the market. We started with, we started from 75 million. From 75 million, the property was brought down to 50 million. And as we speak, that property is asking for, for 45 million. And up till now, nobody has come uh, with strong interest in uh, snapping up that property or buying up that property. So with this, we can see that a fundamental error has been committed before, right from the very beginning, when that property was purchased. So I, looking at this, my client's experience, and I believe that so many participants here have such experience or they know people who have such experience. People who have purchased properties in some locations, now they want to sell. Some of them have even some serious issues like health challenge, and they want to sell and fund uh, their treatment, maybe overseas. And the property, nobody's coming for it, nobody's buying it. They can't even use it to acquire a loan in the bank because the bank may not be able to, those properties are not bankable in terms of collateral. So I would like to ask Mr. Okusaga, what's your advice for newcomers in this space, in this real estate space, or people who don't have much knowledge in real, real estate? So I know a lot of people here have the experience, but also some people are just coming in or would like to invest massively in the real estate space. So I would like to know what your advice is 
let's start, let's start with the newcomers to make sure that such errors are not uh, committed, such errors are avoided um, in the future. Okay. Thank, thank you so much. Very, thank, you very, thank you very much, George. Uh, thank you, Mr. Joseph, for elaborating on the, the last uh, point I made. It was very fantastic. You see, um, uh, how do I put it? I like to use simple layman description of real estate to describe real estate. Real estate is complex, and most people may not experience it in their lifetime. For example, if you have an edit, most likely just go to a mala and buy a dagger or prastamol and use it. If you have malaria, you just go to a pharmacy and go and buy maybe chloroquine and use it. You won't go to the mala again. Most likely, if you have typhoid, you don't go to that pharmacy, you go to a clinic. Because you're like, ah, this treatment is different. Lastly, if you want to do a major surgery, you wouldn't go to that clinic, you'd be looking for a specialist. And what we tie the specialist is coming in the baggy jeans and they just seeing smell of Buddha. No matter what they tell you, the condition of the guy is, you won't let him operate you. Most of the time, people do not experience less in their lifetime because they don't have that amount of money. Real estate is capital intensive. So what do you use to head against that capital intensiveness is advice from professionals, lawyers, engineers, uh, surveyors, and all these words. But let's go to a specific scenario. I'll tell you, I tell my clients, if you are not a professional developer, don't go to land. Land is an alligator. It doesn't produce you any income. It may even swallow the one you have. So when you now want to go and buy land, if that means you are a specialist, there's some investors that they buy land and all the that when developers are around, they can do joint venture with them and make their own real estate. That's a good thing. But don't forget that when you're investing in real estate, there are some risks involved in real estate. Like one of the issues you mentioned, if you know that you're investing and you're going to be taking your money outside the country, it exposes you to foreign exchange risk. And you have to find your edging against that. A lot of FMDQ, a lot of people are doing that to edge against foreign exchange risk now because that should be put in consideration. Also, you should be aware that real estate is not a liquid asset. So when you are trying to buy, as much as you are trying to create liquidity around us. Why? To structure it, the way you structure the transaction. So when you're now trying to buy, so that those are risk in, those are risk involved. The, also, there are also risk involved, you cannot move it. So you put the property in Port Harcourt, now you cannot move it to Lagos. So if any crisis happens in Port Harcourt, it affects your land. There's a, there's a time in Port Harcourt that you have a CFO, but you cannot get to that land. The time that the banks in Port Harcourt are financing transactions in Lagos, they are not financing Port Harcourt. So you have the land there. You are part of that risk. But let's look at what you should look out for. So we'll take time looking at the risk. If you can take an hour to be telling you about risk and real estate, particularly land. But what should you be looking for when you're trying to buy real estate? First, you have to distinguish, am I buying for value in use or value in exchange? Let me put it in layman's language. Do I want to live there or I want to combine so I can sell? When you let me start with that are buying in exchange, that means they want to buy for investment purpose. Three key things. She mentioned one location, location, location. Yes. You can have a proper in good location. Like it is a good location. But the vacancy rate is 40%. That means the 40% chances that you will not get your place occupied on time. That's the void, the void, void or loss of rent is one of the most expensive outgoing in real estate investment. So if I have a good location and I don't have, I'm having loss of rent. Secondly, we have to ensure that it's liquid. As I said, real estate is naturally not a liquid asset. But when you're structuring, you can structure a transfer to be liquid. Have an issue. Lastly, can that place appreciate? And where are these appreciation going to come from? So if I buy a property now, the property, the suppliers are very good, good location, but they are peak. 
They are their peak already. They are not going to appreciate anywhere. And when they go appreciate, it will take some, it, it may not appreciate. Some may take a while. Some will appreciate and take a while. Lastly, what you also avoid is overinvesting. If you have already bought a property that is being sold at 40 million at 80 million, you're already in trouble. So these are key things you should look at when you're trying to invest in a property. So whether landed, but I will always advise, if you are not a professional developer, I always say leave it, leave land alone. Because there's a lot of risk involved. That one is that's the story for another day. But when you have when you have to buy, buy something that is built already. If you are going to buy a land, make sure you have, you have that investment strategy that you buy it, hold it, make sure that you are perfected and you lose your venture for investment. Now, if you are going to live there and you are buying for personal reasons, the next thing you have to eat is comfort. So if all those things are there and that place is not comfortable for you, maybe it's far from where you are staying, just add comfort to it. So how do you make money for real estate? You bought the property, you didn't overinvest, you, are, you, are, you, you ensure that, for example, there are some areas they have in Lagos. Now, thank God for research. The lot of research you have in the market now, I think you have like, four, three, like three to four companies doing China research every quarter, half yearly, annually about what's happening in the market. There are some areas in Lagos that have less than 2% vacancy rates. They are also very. So, what I'm going to think about is I'll say, let me, if it's for investment and I'm not going to live there, I'll go to where, they, where I can quickly rent. When you rent it immediately, you have liquidity because it, rental is another thing. Then consistently get your rent. Is another thing. That's, where, that's where cash flow comes in. Sorry, I missed that point. Cash flow. So consistently get your rent. And that's where management comes in. Let me quickly explain to you about management. People make a mistake. I buy a property of 50, 60 million. I just give one person, I say, the guy says he's managing. He does need property. I say, you should manage your property. I'll ask them, if you have, if your gate plan becomes, a, say, he has a bank tomorrow, he has his own bank tomorrow, will he give me your 60 million? They say, no. Then why give a property of 60 million to the person? The same counterparty risk that the bank pays is what you face when you're going to property somebody. You are giving him the house with the hope that the person will give you the money, the rent up front. And when you come back, you want to get your, the value of your 60 million or more. So when you get the cash flow, you now make sure that, okay, yes, this property is liquid. If I want to sell it, how fast can I sell it? Then um, lastly, appreciation. So if all those things are there, but coming to your man, they mentioned something about put the market for 50, 60. When you are not going to sell, pricing, professional pricing is very important. The transaction I did in the new of recent, I told you, I said, ah, okay, this is your pricing is professionally priced. You know what you say, but you cannot price it. You cannot say it should go up or go down. You are penetrating the market. But immediately you go and put the property, the property of 200 and 300, you have scattered the market. There's high tendency to sell it at 200. Because you have told the market that you are not sophisticated. So the investors are saying yes. And now Nigeria is an investor's market, as we are now. So those who buy that investor say, oh, that guy is not so he's putting it at 300. He doesn't know what he's doing. They know you have been emotional about it. So they wait for you. So don't forget that when you now start marketing, all your agents are too good that is 300. So when you come back, you have to do double marketing to bring not only to, to put the price market, you have to take back that first price and say this is the new price. Most of, most of the time, it takes a while for you to do that. So that's why you see the property state market for a long time. Because when they put it back in the market, they did all those things that they did at first, but they priced it wrongly when they are trying to sell. Is then it stay longer in market. So you are now trying to so you go back to the market and say no, that was not the price, and then the new price. Then change the gate. Most likely sell it below the market value. So that is what always causing the debate. And I think did, did, did I? I think was I able to answer your question a bit? Exactly, exactly. So thank you so much, Mister Okusaga. Wonderful. I consciously, uh, I consciously avoid the legal areas because I also tell people. That area is the question. I leave it to the lawyers to deal with it. I'm an investor. My best friend is my lawyer. We talk morning, afternoon, night. Let, so I just avoided those things. Focus on the commercial. Let your legal lawyer deal with the documentation. If you are trying to construct, focus on the commercial. Let your engineer and your architect deal with the building. That's interesting. 
Thank you so much, Mr. Kusaga. Thank you for that elaborate, um, that elaborate um, explanation. One thing I can take away from your explanation is one, knowledge. If you have the right knowledge and use the right people, have the right valuation for the property, you may not have to run into some of these problems. So um, I want to use opportunity to uh, um, inform the participant that the question and answer um, chat room is open. Question and answer room is open. Don't use the chat room, use the question and answer room. And we'll be taking some of the questions because I've just discovered that a lot of people are now talking about the legal aspect of uh, real estate, mostly as it concerns documentation. If I have taken a look at my, my questions and I'm seeing that a lot of people are, are actually are dwelling so much. Some of our participants here asking questions. Most of the questions are revolving around documentation, affection of titles and all that. So uh, Ms. Mrs. Ajose, I want to ask one question from a participant. Uh, I can't, he wrote his name in Arabic. I can't read Arabic. Sorry, I may not be able to call your name. Uh, so he's saying, or she is saying, good morning, Madam Jose. If one buys a landed property in an estate, will a C of O be given? Or the estate has a global C of O many times. So I would like you to just briefly touch on this because we have a lot of questions as regards title. So as you explain, as I bring in, bring out some of these questions, then you will just uh, flesh out the major points, then we proceed. Thank you. Okay. I just read some of the questions in your Q&A section. You may have to tell some of them to just get a lawyer. There are no questions that we'll be able to answer on this forum. Um, but regarding the person who's asking about um, whether a COO will be given or a COO will not be given, it's it's not a one size fits all answer. It depends on the root of title and how the arrangement has been structured. So if you find yourself in a situation where um, a developer has bought um, a parcel of land and the title that the developer has is the C of O, the first rule is there's never a time where more than one COO is issued over the same land. So if it turns out that you are making an investment or buying property in an estate where the root of title sits with the developer and the developer has a global COO, that means that nobody in that location will have another COO. And it does not mean that the title is bad. So where the root of title is the C of O and an interest in part of that land is to be vested in another person, another instrument will be issued on the back of the C of O that recognizes that a portion of that interest has been transferred to you. Typically a deed would be used to transfer that interest. Now, when a deed has been issued by the holder of the C of O, if you're taking a portion, usually it may be called a deed of partition or a deed of subdivision, just to show that you're not taking the full you know, um, interest. But remember that a deed without governor's consent is not an instrument of transfer. It does not transfer a legal title. So if you get a deed, you have to ensure that you go one step further to get a governor's consent. It is when the consent of the governor is given that you can deem that a transfer of interest has happened. I hope that um, answers um, the participant's question. If you need more, then you will have to consult a lawyer and go and pay legal fees. <laughs> okay, that's interesting. <laughs> That's interesting. Thank you so much. And one of the things I, I, I one of the things I learned from um, Mr. Okusaga is the fact that real estate investment has now um, is no longer how it used to be before. 
you have to bring some creative or innovative structures to it for you to be able to maximize value or profit. And that's a very um, important point. It's not like, okay, I want to buy land, I want to buy house, no. You can even create it in such a way that you can find liquidity in it, depending on your aims and your objectives. And I think this is one of the reasons why you need um, a real estate advisor. So uh, Charles Emuze is asking this very important question. And Kemi, I would, please, I would like you to help us answer. I said, does Mary Stem help with due diligence for prospective properties? Over to you, Kemi. Um, due diligence for a property is, is um, in several phases. It's not just one thing. There's the legal aspects, there's the social aspects of it. Yes, at Mary Stem, we can handle you through the process and we work with um, professionals who are very vast in that field and um, to ensure that you have the proper report that you're supposed to have that covers all of the aspects on um, any property that you intend to buy. So yes, at Mary Stem, we can work with you um, using our professionals that we work with as well to ensure that this is done properly. Thank you. Okay, that's fine. So, uh, Kenny, before I let you go, please, I would like you to um, um, take a shot at this question from Tuli Dakoji. He said, is crowdfunding a viable entry route into the real estate sector? Also, are the return on investments decent enough for a moderately aggressive investor? Crowdfunding is the way of putting together to finance real estate projects. Um, it's more like you're investing, it's, it's like you're investing in your typical, um, say, treasury bills, um, fixed deposits rather, but it is backed by real estate. So what that fund, that fund portfolio, what it's investing in is that real estate project. So um, there's, there are certain factors that are considered as well. There has to be, um, there has to be factors, the factors that have to be considered are the risk involved in that particular project or whatever it is that the fund is putting together. But yes, for clients who would rather do investments and earn returns on real estate without necessarily going through the nitty gritty or going through the whole um, process of physical investment, or in some cases, people who don't have um, the capital to invest in the kind of property that will give them the kind of return that they are looking for, they can invest in funds. So the person, the people who want to go into that project will be the ones creating the crowdfunding. They'll be pulling funds together and investors can buy into such funds. Um, it's the, the, the major difference is uh, between that and REITs is that REITs are mostly listed on the floor of the exchange. And depending on what process, there's a lot of um, the, the um, SEC is also looking at um, crowdfunding right now. Um, it's still majorly developing in Nigeria. The, regulations around us is really just um, coming up. There was a circular on that sometime last year and some rules around that. So there's certain rules that um, the crowdfunding partners are supposed to go through and um, there will be some um, documents containing information on that investment that investors should go through and properly understand and know the risks inherent and if they are fine with that before going into such investments. Okay, thank you so much, Kenny. So if you're interested in a particular crowd, crowdfunding um, uh, uh, investment, I think one of the things you need to find out is dig deeply, do your research, uh, and if possible, speak with a real estate advisor. And that's what Kemi and team will do for you if you approach them. If you approach Mary's them, they will who actually do uh, some of these things, help at, give you that advisory services. One of the things we do at the real estate, uh, within the real estate space is advisory service. So we render you that advisory service and help you. Uh, it's not just about investing. We'll, we'll try to help align both your long-term and short-term goals and objectives towards that um, investment in a very creative way. That at the end of the day, you can look back and smile and say, wow, I've done something great. So it's always good you carry, carry your uh, real estate advisor along. Then there's this, before we move to the next um, segment, there's this question I would like us to 
answer. And I think I would like Mr. Kusaga to, to answer this question. And if possible, maybe Mr. Ajose can just um, throw in more light. It's from Kennedy Edadike. And he's saying there's also the problems, uh, there's also the problem of off plan sales, which will see developers default on contractual commitments. And with the poor legal system we currently operate, what is Mr. Okusaga and, and Tosin views on this? Off plan sales. I think it's very it's a very popular um, real estate structure that we have mostly in Lagos. So Mr. Okusaga. So, 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 so. Uh, do I have the floor? Yes, you have the floor. You can. Okay. Okay. Um, do justice. We said a lot of that, but uh, off plan is a way of investing. But as I said, because you are doing off plan, does not devoid you of all your strategies. Now, when you meet a real estate agent, not your gate man or your cousin or your brother, a personal real estate agent. It doesn't need to be a survey, it can be an actor, it can come from where they're any, they can come from where they're you know, what does the real estate agent do for you? They send you information, contact, and advice. So they have that information, so they know the developers that have been delivered. They know the ones that are not delivered. The developer that we pay now, I won't, that I won't deliver. I've always not been delivering or meeting his timeline before that period. Some of them that will not do the building, the finishing will be terrible. They've always been doing that. But you know, the difference is that you are not in the market, you are just coming in. And most of them live abroad. So they don't know what is happening. And just come and tell your brother, the guy that, that the person that is advising you also is not in the market. So he doesn't have sufficient information. He doesn't have the contact of who knows that guy, who is the developer. And he cannot advise you. And lastly, he cannot influence anything because he's not in that market. So when you're going to, as I say, I consciously avoid the technical areas, I focus on commercial, literally, because my expertise is in real estate finance and investment. So I put my money, there are questions I deal with all those bottlenecks. Now, before you go into a, a, a real estate off plan investment, who is the person developing this project? The land, does he have a, does he have a title? Now, the payment, is it attached to any milestone? So for example, now, if you say you are going to tell me to pay 10%, what milestone is that 10% attached to? So for example, I can say 10% for land and documentation. So you cite the land, that there's a land there, and this is the opposition. Is it that you bought the land or you did the joint venture agreement? That should be in place. Then you can say, okay, the next one will be 20% for foundation. So when you are paying 20%, you visit site, you see the foundation is there. They say, okay, the next 20% is for uh, Linton. You know, you see that, that or you see, they say for, for reinforcement, you can see the reinforcement. They can say the next one is when you move for carcass. You know, you can say the next one is okay when you are doing painting and finishing. So you make sure that for every property money you pay, there's a mouth to attach. So that just okay, you pay 10, 10, 10, 10 percent over 10 months or 20 months. What are the milestones attached to it? And at the document you sign. So when you, so for example, now you get there, you pay 10 percent, and you got there, there's no foundation. You know, you minimize your risk. I can really get your lawyers involved to get 10% back. Like I keep on putting money in that, but it's a very, leaving the risk, because of the risk involved, it made it a very, you know, as you said, the higher the risk, the better the return. So because of the risk involved in this off plan sale, it makes a very good investment. So I've done a lot of off plan sale, that even before we pay the last chance, someone's already waiting for us to send it to them. One of the best investments will be off plan. I'll make a spread of minimum of 10, 20 million spread on this off plan sale. And I also tell people when you have your investment portfolio, don't put your 100% money in off plan. So you buy some, you sit, then you say, okay, maybe out of your portfolio, maybe 30% is off plan. So that when you also that you use that in minimizing your own risk that you're involved in investing in off plan. But it's a very viable project, it's a very viable investment that has good results. But you should also be aware of the risk and make sure somebody is holding your hand to the left, your, your lawyer, and to write your agent that information. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you so much. I don't, I, I, I would want to know if um, uh, Mr. Jose has one or two things to uh, add to it before we move to the next segment. Okay, um, thank you. Thank you. Okay, just a, um, a couple of things. And I think that we need to, 
have a deeper understanding of what we are doing when we do off-plan investing. People need to understand that off-plan investing changes your position as an investor from one who is trying to acquire real estate to one who is lending to a developer. And the risk parameters are absolutely and completely different. So you have put yourself in a situation where on one end you are lending to the developer because what is basically happening is that you are funding the development. So when a bank is giving money to a borrower, what are the typical risks that they are open to? But the anomaly in this arrangement is that you go into it with the risks um, that a typical lender would take, but you have documentation that is tailored towards and buying a property. So that means that you have no protection on one end. So what are we doing? What, what are you doing? You are giving money to this guy and he's going to use your money to build. And he's promising you returns. Now, those returns will be converted. The returns and the principal will be converted to an interest in the development when it is completed. In simple terms, that is what is happening. So if the project runs into trouble, what will happen is there would be, you know, it will become very, very impossible for you to get your money back. Remember that I've said you have left the side of a buyer, you have moved to the side of a lender, right? And this guy cannot pay you back until the project is completed because he needs the cash flows to be able to pay you back. So what you find a lot of times is that people are playing these games. So I, I want to do an off-plan sale. I'm, I'm doing a, a project that is maybe 500 million to complete. And then I say to myself, I'm going to raise maybe 220 million of um, off-plan financing. Some of these developers have like three, four, five projects running back to back. And then they use money from you know, project A, they spread it across the five projects, they over leverage the money they are collecting and they put you in an at-risk position. So I'm taking the, the, the paint to explain just so that people have a clear picture of what is happening. So the next time you are doing an off-plan development or investment, there are many questions you need to be asking beyond when is the project going to be completed? When are you going to you know, do this or when are you going to do that? Remember that, like I said, you are putting yourself in the position of a lender. So what are the questions that a lender should be asking? What's the, how much do you need to finish the project? How much are you raising? How much of off-plan financing are you getting for the whole project? You know, these are questions that, you know, a lot of people will not let you ask, but we need to become savvy and intelligent investors and start asking the right questions. Because if the structure is, you know, faulty ab initio, you can be sure that there is no out on that investment. So, I mean, beyond, you know, looking at it as, okay, when am I going to pay the next installment? And then again, if you are making commitments as, um, an investor to an off-plan arrangement, please be sure that you have the funds. Please be sure that you can pay as and when due. Because another thing is you find people in situations where they are, they are, they are praying to God. So you start, you make the first you know, installment payment. You don't really have a clear path for how to finish the payment. And a lot of developers are able to capitalize on this because once you are in breach, you cannot really enforce a commitment. You can't enforce the conditions of the arrangement that you have entered into. So it's very important that there's a clear line of sight. You on your own part are not going to default in that arrangement. And the documentation that you need when you are going into off-plan arrangements must be clearly different from if you are doing an outright buy. So you're not just concerned about delivery, quality of delivery. You're also con concerned about the general leverage ratio of the project. The, you're, you're, you want to know what the, the, the developer is using the money for, 
whether he's spreading it across projects, he wants to know what their history is like in delivering the other project that they have. So I don't want to say too much <laughs> because, you know, there are many tables that will be shaken, but that's just the reality. Look at yourself as a lender and take all the necessary precautions that you would if you are borrowing money to somebody. Okay, thank you so much, Mr. Joseph. Um, due diligence is key. And like what was George, 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 let me just come in to quickly clear some, uh, just uh, support what she said. Okay. You know, sorry, can I go ahead? Yes, just, uh, just keep it a bit brief because we're trying to move no, to no, the no, next. No, just, just something brief. You see, okay, thank you. Now, as I was saying that time, information is very key. You see, that kind of developer that you are going to be lending to is risky. You are off that already. The developer has his funds available. He just wants to make sure that he has enough ticker to make sure that he gets, he doesn't, the cost of funds in the bank is reduced. So it's not going to use your money to build. That kind of developer, it's risky. The best thing to do is to move back. That's why I find out most of the time when you have a good agent and say, oh, I'm not plan, he will know that developer has funding, who is fund developer, will tell you everything. So when you realize that when it's not liquid, you must really make sure you get that kind of compensation. So you are buying a property for investment, you are making a return on it. Now, the boring part of it, you also need, must make sure you make returns from it as an investor. That means you choose, okay, let me, so I'm going to sell this out at a discount because I'm buying off plan normally. Now, if you are not, if you are also going to use my money to, to build them and buy money, what percentage am I going to get on that? So there's the equity part of it and then the debt part of what the investment you are doing. That, and that is if you must you have, you have a high risk appetite and you must go into it, then make sure you are compensated. That's all. Wow. Thank you so much. I like that beautiful insight. So all these things come to um, the, the calcul some calculations. And oftentimes, you may not be able to go through the rigors. That is why you need an advisor. Somebody was asking uh, in the Q&A uh, room if if uh, we can also render ad, uh, advisory service to those in Anambra in Eastern part of Nigeria and, and the likes, knowing that we are present in Lagos. Uh, but the answer is whether you are participating from Kano, you're participating from Eduguri or Enugu, we are always here to render you that um, service. So you can reach out to us, um, I can, I, Maybe before the end of this session, we'll also drop maybe our email address and our phone numbers that you can call. But like um, we have always, we have always um, reiterated here, it is very, very important that proper advisory services are rendered to you before you go into real estate investment. So thank you so much. Um, I will hand over to Kemi now. Kemi will take us to the next, take us through the next. Uh, segment. Kemi, are you there? Hello, Kemi. Hello, George. Yeah. Yes, um, I've been following the session keenly. Our next session is our next next um, question is supposed to talk about title documentations, um, building uh, building on non-approved areas of property. We have a case, um, a case of someone who bought a property and then more recently there was demolition um, because they were, the government said that they built the properties on um, the water course. This was in Imo State and some demolition also happened in Banana Island. Um, so it, it then brings to fore how people go ahead to have their buildings without properly doing um, the necessary documentation like Mrs. Ajose rightly pointed out. Because if you had gone through planning in some situations, you would have been able to realize that th those properties, especially if you do proper due diligence, that property, you shouldn't buy them because there's some of these properties that have been clearly earmarked for certain things in the future. Maybe those things are not crystallizing right now, but they've been earmarked for those um, things. And it would not be proper for you to buy such a property and lose it in future. However, if you had bought such a property and you have title, well, in this case, 
Um, some had title, some didn't. So if you had title, um, and at the end of the day, you had gone through all of the proper processes, and at the end of the day, there was still you know, a notice to you that there would be demolition of your property because of maybe rights of, um, right of way or maybe um, road extensions, water costs, as in this case. So in that situation, Mr. Jose, what, what do you do? What, um, is there any law that protects owners of properties that are built in these areas? Sorry, yes, thank you. Thank you, Kemi. Um, so first and foremost, um, I, I, when I was answering the first question before, I talked about use. So there are legal uses and there are illegal uses of property. And let's start from understanding that um, there are many times that demolition happens because of illegal or improper use. One of it is if you are violating the planning rules or regulations. I mean, I've also had situations where, you know, in the same banana island, and there are many times that we buy properties for clients, you know, in those kinds of locations. And for many people that have their property on the water course, because a lot of times you are able to move inwards into the water. There have been situations where a lot of people have gone to ask for approvals from government to sand fill and extend into the water. In Banana Island particularly, a lot of that has happened. But you also find that there are many times that because you know these things happen, many people have gone ahead and done those extensions illegally, right? In some other situations, people have extended beyond the points that have been authorized for them to sign and use. So the first question will be, this demolition order, is it issued because of illegal use of property? If it is, then the government has the right to demand that that illegal use ceases, whether they are demolishing what you have built. I mean, we have people that build on power lines on areas that are restricted. And you know, when they send their demolition orders, they come and you know say, oh, government is doing this or government is doing that. So the first question is, are you, you know, is this on account of an illegal use? If it is, government owes you no explanation and they do not owe you any compensation, especially if you have bought outside of the government system. So there are still, you know, lands that are not covered, you know, within the within the title system of the of the state government or the federal government as it were, where you are buying from people that have held those lands historically. But in every part of Nigeria, there are approved plan zones for every area. There are some areas where they've been earmarked for railway. There are some areas that are green zones that are not expected to be developed. There are some areas where you have water channels or drainages and all of that. So whether somebody somewhere sold it to you, they had a survey, they said they have been living there for a hundred years or whatever. If you acquire that land and you are using it contrary to the planning regulations or the approved you know, use for those areas, it's only a matter of time before you know, the law will catch up with you. And if that happens, unfortunately, you would not have any rights legally to continue to use properties in those locations. So that's on, one, on, on the one hand. There are, however, situations where you may have legal title in property, but for good reason, the government has to demand that you exit those properties. There are laws around this, even within the Land Use Act. So we all know that in Nigeria, under our legal system, in many areas, the governor of the state is a custodian of land in those jurisdictions. And so they have also been empowered under the Land Use Act to acquire property for overriding public interests. This public interest could be health reasons if the life 
of the people in those areas are threatened for whatever reason. It could be for ease of um, traffic. It could be for, you know, um, special state projects that will be in the interest of, you know, the whole community and all of that. So if you have legal title to land and the government wants to acquire the land, first off, they must establish that it's for overriding public interest. You must, you, you must care to know the reason why they will take the land from you. And it must be that they have a compelling reason why they want to do this acquisition. Now, all they have to do is to serve the required notices on you for you to exit, typically you will have to, you would have to leave. However, they owe you a, they owe you an obligation for compensation. They owe you an obligation for compensation. So if you find yourself where, you know, you are getting orders from government that they want to demolish and all of that, they, there's typically a panel that is set up to assess and plan to compensate. Now, the procedure for arriving at this compensation is what has, from time immemorial, always been an issue. The law requires that fair and adequate compensation is, is paid. However, what is fair and adequate compensation? The, the landowner and government will never align on what is fair and adequate for obvious reasons. Are you going to determine it based on the value of the land and the improvements? What of the cost of relocation? What of the emotional cost? What of the inconvenience? You know, so typically the two sides will never be aligned. That is the reality. The two sides will never be aligned. But government does have an obligation to pay what is fair and what is adequate. We also find ourselves in many situations where government acquires land under the guise of overriding public interest. But you find that several years down the line, they reallocate the land to some people else for commercial reasons. Now, what do you do in this situation? You can actually use the instrumentality of the law to enforce your rights. Now, the other question will be, how long will it take? I mean, you, you can, I mean, your guess is, is, is as good as mine, but there are processes that would enable you, you know, seek redress before the court of law. It may be slow, it may be painful, but um, it's not impossible. So um, just to go over again, if you have a legal valid title, government, even in spite of your legal valid title, can acquire the land, they can ask you to vacate they can demolish, but if the demolition is on account of an illegal um, um, use or maybe you don't even have title at all, unless you have a legal interest that is recognized by law, you even have no basis to you know, demand compensation or any basis to even want to have, you know, start conversations with the government. That's the first thing. But if you do have legal valid title, you have an interest that is legally recognized, the government owes you an obligation to follow due processes in terms of notices, in terms of giving you time to exit, and in terms of ensuring that you are fairly and adequately compensated. Sometimes the compensation comes in terms of relocating you to another place. But I mean, if I had a property, if I, my property was built up and I was living there and you relocate me, it's important that you are not giving me just land alone. There must be sufficient compensation for me to even, you know, build up something else for me to leave. But the reality of our system is the government does have the right to acquire your property, even if you have legal and valid title. I hope that um, answers the question, Kemi. Yeah, yes, it does. Thank you very much. Um, another question is um, the time, the, there are several bottlenecks, especially when it comes to title, um, title registration. Um, having worked with um, various, you know, outsourcing schemes, intervention, being um, an advisor to them, like the, the Ministry of Finance, um, the, the program on mortgage and all of that, and that's with the CBN, FSS 20 to 2020. 
So what what do you think? What what would you advise that government does um, that the government does to ensure that the the process is seamless? And so because that's one of the things that discourages people um, to, to that they don't want they don't want to go or they procrastinate because they know that it's not a, it's not a black and white thing. I can't just go drop my documentation. I have to do a lot of things. See someone come back tomorrow, sometimes it takes forever, especially if you don't know what office to go at what time. What, what would you advise that um, government does to? Okay, that to question is that that to me. Process. Yes. Okay, so, so, so we find ourselves in an environment where we have very endemic issues. So this particular issue is not exclusive to the real estate market alone. It is a systemic problem, right? Um, but historically, I think that government has tried to take control over real estate as an asset because of the thinking that it's a finite resource and therefore you, I mean, you, you will know that in Nigeria and under the Nigerian legal system, and same for a lot of African countries, there is nothing called freehold interest. You cannot hold real estate or land in perpetuity. As of the 1970s, when you know this promulgation was done, I believe that it was done out of good intention because it gives everyone a fair chance to actually have access to land. You don't have situations where some families are entrenched as you know the ones that have land and some people are you know um, committed to perpetually serve these people. In some communities you have or some, some environments where you have freehold systems. It is hard to make a switch from being wealthy to 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 from not being wealthy or from or, or from coming from humble backgrounds to being wealthy because one of the measures of wealth of course you know is is land and real estate right so in our own environment the government wants to hold custody of the land and allocate it on a fair basis under a trust you know system so that the son of a nobody who works hard and becomes somebody can have access to land or if you need land for commercial reasons, you can have easy access to it. So perhaps the intention was noble at the at the at the onset, but it has cost us, you know, some significant strain in terms of you know our economy and the way you know commerce works. So you find yourself in a situation where before anything happens in terms of um, the real estate market you have to make a stop with the government. Two private individuals have done a deal. They have decided to transfer the rights in their asset to each other, but that interest will not move until a governor says it's okay. And he has so much power to determine whether he's going to say it's okay or it's not okay, right? So we find ourselves in that situation. That is the that is the that is the start of it. Now, our systems generally, our government systems generally are slow, bureaucratic, and there is a lot of red tape. So it's not exclusive to you know transfer of title alone. Even planning is the same thing. The slow processes are there. So what then do we need to do? We need to continue to push for efficiency within the government systems. And let me also mention that, you know, a lot of times we talk about delay, we transfer and all of that. It's not the same experience across the country. There are some states where things are better and they are easier. But of course, these are the states that don't really have a lot of, you know, economic activity and, you know, there isn't a lot that is going on in their, in their real, estate, um, real estate markets. So the experience, you know, differs from state to state. In Abuja, I don't know whether people here are aware, you cannot even transfer title for certain uh, you know, types of um, property. And this has been on for more than 10 years, right? 
So there are a lot of endemic issues. So in Abuja, for instance, if you buy landed property in some of those areas, it is actually impossible to go and perfect your title. Because there was a, a stand down on, on, on transfer of title and it has continued for several many years. So should that deter us from doing um, transactions in real estate? No, we continue to put pressure and hope that the systems will become a bit more efficient. But what we simply need is to use technology to aid you know, some of these um, processes and systems as is done overseas. We have blockchain, blockchain technology now that can have open source ledgers where as transactions are happening, they can be captured and everybody knows that, oh, Mr. Okusaga has sold his property to um, Mrs. Omoni or, you know, things have happened. And as soon as both parties exchange an automated contract within the system, it recognizes that there has been a transfer of title within seconds. And this open ledger is available to everybody. So if I am interested in the property, I can just you know, have the property number and check. And I know what happened one second ago on that property. That's where we need to be as a country. And I do hope that you know, we would um, enable our systems to work by adopting technology. But in the meantime, we keep pushing with the ease of doing business um, that Quebec is pushing. I think things are getting you know, a bit better even in a state like Lagos, now you can do perfection, start and close within six months. There were times in the past that you could be on it for several many years. So we are inching closer to you know, making things easier and making things um, 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 a lot better, but it's not exclusive to this, um, um, to real estate or transfer of title alone. Some of you may be having difficulty doing NIN registration, it's just, it's just an endemic thing within our Nigerian system and the civil service. So I would say we keep living with you know, the situation and we keep you know, making you know, demands for things to become better and seamless. And the easy way to do that is to embrace technology. Thank you for that, um, Mrs. Minister Joseph. Um, like you said, we keep pushing and the more people, people go through these processes, the more um, people are able to throw up what their challenges are, the more the professionals. Like I said earlier, the, the professionals um, in Lagos State, in the real estate space, have, they've been doing a lot with the government. Um, it, that's also evident from Mrs. Adjusta's profile, to ensure that things are done the way they should be. And we believe that with consistency, um, we will get there very soon. Thank you, Mr. Adjusta. Like I said, it's something that is very common. We've been getting a lot of feedback on that from our clients. Um, people who buy properties and they, they, they buy, especially people who live in diaspora, they buy properties for investment purposes and they have, um, because they want to generate rental income, they have tenants um, in them. However, they don't have any form of management. Yes, they put in um, whatever securities sometimes they have, um, they have one or two persons checking on those properties, but there is no formal property management process in place. And um, this particular case, the person lives in diaspora and he, he had tenants who are in the properties, very um, seemingly responsible tenants. They remit their rent at all times. They don't have any Say for one or two situations, the majority of the properties, they don't have any situation of um, not paying rent or anything. So he had no cause to suspect any foul play. He was getting his rent and um, he came to the country at one point and decided to check on his properties. First thing, he, he had a friend who also, um, who he realized had a property somewhere around his and then what the, the friend was getting as rental income on the property was very far off from his. He was getting something way lower than what his friend um, was getting. And also he found out that those people who were paying in the rent, those people who he signed the lease agreements with were not the ones, in some cases were not the ones who were 
um, living in those apartments. It was more like they had subletted it to um, other other persons, and those persons were living there, there in those properties. He had no idea about that because he was still relating with um, the people that he rented the property to. So in, in, in this situation, Mr. Kusaga, what's, what's, do you think that property management is necessary? People manage their properties by themselves. Do you think that it is necessary to have any uh, proper structure in place for your um, for the management of your properties. And in this case, I don't mean facilities management as in the case of estates. These are standalone properties that you just have um, tenants in. Is it necessary and how receptive, in your opinion and your experience, um, are investors to property management? Mr. Akusaga, this is for you. Thank you, Kemi. Um, uh, as I said earlier, real estate is a, is a business. Imagine, just imagine how many will be if they do have, doesn't have a managing director. And every time the chairman have to call you and tell you, Kemi, how is the business? And directors have to call you direct themselves to ask you, it will be chaotic and it will be not efficient. So what does property management do? It creates three things. It creates efficiency that brings in liquidity and eventually gives you profitability. Now, is it that you can manage your yourself? Yes, you can. The way you can wash your clothes yourself if you just have one or two clothes. But when you have a lot of clothes, or you have to, and you want to make sure that that clothes give you good returns in terms of presentation, you start engaging someone that can manage your outfit for you and how you wear it. Same thing for real estate. The owner of the business is the chairman. The man, property manager is the managing director of that business. So number four, Alara Street, is a business. That property manager is paid a certain amount annually to ensure that that property is efficient, that that property brings liquidity, and at the end of the day, it's profitable. And when we are disposing, it has appreciated because it's well maintained. There are two scenarios to this thing. There are some that don't say, I don't want to manage until when there's a problem. So they will call me, Sir Joseph. I say, That tenant is not paying. I want to give him quick notice. I know she hears things like that. That's one part. I say, But so can you hear me get a lawyer? That tenant is not paying. He's not paying for three years. I want to get him out. That's one part. Then the other part is that the people that get property management and don't get professionals to manage it. Because why? That one can take a cheaper amount, amount or a, cheap, a less percentage in fees. So they still don't get that efficiency and there's no liquidity. And there's no, if there's liquidity, it doesn't lead to profitability. The last one are people that know that I'm, I'm not a property person. That's why I have three, four, five properties, seven, eight, nine properties. I don't have that time to manage it and get a professional. Manage it and ensure they see that there's an efficiency in the system of management, there's general, there's liquidity, there's profitability, and when they dispose, dispose, uh, dispose of it, they still make additional profits. Now, it is important that when you have more than one property that you are not living in, I advise, because property management is a lot of work. That when you charge 10% to buy property, most of you use between four to six percent of that income to manage that property. Now there are three critical, there are two critical areas, and there's one at the end. One, the same counterparty risk you have when you are giving a credit out is the same counterparty risk you have when you are renting the house to somebody. That means you are telling that person that this house of 100 million naira. Tell me, I'm giving it to you. You are going to pay me interest upfront for that 100, 100 million loan, which comes in form of rent, and you give me the interest in advance every year. And after five years, I want my house back, which is at the value of 100 million, I get in now, so I can be able to trade and get more money off it. 
But if you give it to, if you don't, if if Kemi says she works in Maristem and she actually sells iron rod, you know who they knew it. Imagine if, if I credit you know that you have made that the, the credit is already bad because you're not going to verify who that person is. So two critical areas: tenant selection and rent collection is very key in this case. There are other like simple thing, maintenance and also. So if you won't get a good property manager that is in the market, that can give you multiple tenants, that can give you 10 good tenants, I can pick the best out of those 10. That's where it comes from. Because if you try to manage yourself, you don't have enough of network to give you those 10 tenants that you can pick from. So you have like two or three. So that we let me just pick one. So most that inter is the point out from the fact that the tenant they pick is bad. Don't forget, an average property manager is an agent or a lawyer that has a network. And what they sell is information, contact, and advice. So you have a lot of people that are trying to rent house that come to them. That's one. Two, the lease administration. That is like this, also a very important thing, but that is not, it's, it's also very critical. How do you document your lease? This thing, are you doing one year setting? Or is it for two years? Is it for five years? So you have to make sure that even if it's not a lawyer that is managing the place, your manager sit down there and draw up an agreement that reflects your relationship between both parties. So when you want to say you are not doing it again, it is easy. For example, the example we did, the man said that we need the property next one year. We inform the tenants. He said, ah, there's no point that even she's going to get married, the husband is even building something, blah, blah, blah. Well, then they moved in. Then my guy said, okay, I need the house now. They said, no. Even the husband has come to join her in the house and say, hey, there's this thing where they're going, story. But make it clear. The agreement reflected that it was a setting, one year setting. Two, he also gave contract. If you want to stay there more than that one year setting, you pay us 10,000 naira per day. So the option was their own. You can, you can continue staying and you pay 10,000 naira per day. And the thing that I don't think it was not realistic. And they had to leave. They played for two months. He engaged them with the lawyer. The lawyer came and got him home. Another mistake people made. Because we still have a good relationship with the lawyer that did the agreement, I stepped back as a property manager and said, lawyer should discuss with you and put the action out. So property management should be seen. Property should be seen. So if you are, you ask number four, Allah State, number four, Allah State is a business that needs all the money. I personally mind it. If you have another one, number six, those most street is also a business. Now you can have a group of business and have a group MD managing those business. That MD must do competence. Before the MD of medicine came in, it is because the board see that it is, is it will manage the group, it showed companies in managing those other various business and in various regions. That is why it was appointed the MD. Same thing for management. You must make sure that best management of your property reflects that competency. Because if your house boy tells you is now a banker, you won't give him your 60 million, 100 million. That same mentality should come to the house that you took all your money. That must be the most, that may be the most expensive thing you ever invested. So immediately you have more than one, uh, more than two houses, you are not staying in any of them, you should have a property manager. What do they do? They create efficiency. That efficiency will make you have liquidity, that means your rent will come on time and you lead to profitability when you are exiting that transaction. I think I, I'll maybe to explain the brief way and layman for everyone to understand. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Akusaga. Um, to the attendees, everyone, um, we will be putting on the polls right now. Please check your screen and try to answer the questions um, on the poll, please. Thank you. I see that George is back. George. Yeah, tell me I'm back. <clears throat> All right, thank can you, you hear me now? Yes, I can hear you perfectly. Okay, thank you so much, um, Kemi. Thank you so much, uh, the panelists. 
At this point, I would want, um, Kemi, I would like to direct this important question to you. I know that looking at the questions at the chat room, a lot of clients or prospects present or attendees are uh, actually interested in knowing how Meristem can be of value of great help to them. How can Meristem make their real estate investing uh, so easy and um, without um, much problems? So in your units, how do you help clients, you know, um, ensure that they have a smooth investing experience? Okay, thank you for that, George. Um, I also mentioned the importance of management. Mrs. Ajose also has mentioned several important things. At some point, she said, just advise them to get a lawyer. There are certain things that you cannot do by yourself, no matter how many legal books that you've read. Um, it is the same way that you cannot properly, um, adequately manage your properties in some situation. And also, we've talked, well, we've talked about passive and active investments. The same way you have a portfolio of stocks that you actively look over, the same way you have your fixed income, your bonds, and you look at what positions you are to exit, what positions you are to enter, the same way you would need a, an advisor to talk to you on putting funds in investment. It is the exact same way you should treat your real estate investments. They are no different. You should get an advisor to advise you properly on making real estate investments. The advisor would hold you through where you need a lawyer, where you need an estate valuer, where you need a surveyor. All of, this, all of these things we can work with you to do at Meristem. We also manage properties just as we manage assets and fund investments. We would manage your properties the same way you would need to rebalance your stock portfolio. It's the same way you would need to balance your real estate portfolio. There, um, there have been several questions about um, when an area peaks. When you, you, you cannot, it's the same way you would not buy a stock when the price is very high. It's the same way you should not buy a, um, a property, especially if it's not that you're just buying it to live in. Even if you're buying it to live in, at some point you may need to move out of that property into another one. So for every real estate investment you're going to make, you need to make conscious decision. You need to be very articulate, very deliberate in making those investments. And you need, like I said, you need advice in making these investments. If you have a portfolio of properties as your investment portfolio, they are not supposed to be there and static forever. You need to rebalance. There are some properties that there's no point holding on to them anymore. You need to exit those properties and move into other properties that have better yield. You can also have a mix, the same way you would diversify um, your stocks. You will not have all blue chip. You, you can have blue chip. You can have some other investment. You can, you can mix with insurance, consumer goods, and all of that. It's the same way you should have a proper mix of real estate in your portfolio. And at Meristem, we offer you the services of advisory management. We also work with professionals. We have worked with these people for other clients and even for our own proprietary investments. We can tell you the, the people that you would, we mentioned developers. Um, I've seen questions in the chat room about, development, about developers. Yes, they are, um, the government is also aware of this and they are making efforts to have a list of verified developers that people can go into. It's not every developer that would sell off plan to you that will, you know, that will be bad. No, we're not saying off plan um, sales or, are bad or off plan investments are bad, but these things need to be checked out. So at Mary's them, just as you hand over your, your stock portfolios to us, just as you hand over your fixed income portfolios to us. We are saying hand over your real estate portfolios to us. Um, it's an asset class and should be given all of the necessary attention that you would give any other investment um, of yours. So that is the service that we offer, offer to clients. There are people who want to build. Yes, we are not builders, but we can monitor that process to you. for you. We can um, follow, uh, follow through that process there, there are specified documentation that we will work with lawyers to ensure that you get. There are due diligence processes that you should go through 
before buying a property, we will work with you to ensure that this is done as well. So those are the things that we offer at the real estate units of Maristan. Quite, quite, yeah, quite insightful, Kemi. Thank you so much. And I think at this point, we have two persons raising their hands. Um, I would like them to get unmuted so that they can ask their question briefly. We are gradually winding down. Um, we'll take a few, a few questions and um, begin to wrap up a bit. Good afternoon, Mr. Uh, yeah, good afternoon, Mr. Andre Aji. Yes, thank you very much for having me. I have portfolio, stock portfolio with Meristem. Um, and for I've had it for some time now. And I didn't know uh, actually that you manage real estate. Uh, uh, so it's really good to know about this. Uh, apart from my own personal interest in adding real estate to my portfolio, I belong to a very effective cooperative. I live and work in Makodi, by the way, uh, the state teaching hospital, the uh, University University Teaching Hospital. And we have a very effective cooperative that uh, we have had um, idle funds lying around and for which we have been trying to see how we can put it into good use. We had a an investment committee, they've not been making that much progress, but we decided as ESCO to look out for other things. So I think this webinar has come at a good time. I'm wondering how I can get good enough information so that if possible, I pass it on to the ESCO for consideration, the ESCO of the Cooperative Club for consideration. And I don't know what one can invest in the real estate sector with you. And the idea of uh, the returns, the duration, and so on. So that's what I would like uh, some response to. Thank you very much. Okay, beautiful one, Mr. Andrew. Thank you so much. Uh, Kemi, I would like you to speak to this, please. Thank you, Mr. Andrew. Like you said, you have your stock portfolio with us. The same way that your objectives were considered in creating the stock portfolio, we would have to sit with you um, or members of the ESCO if you like that to discuss what the objectives are, what, you know, objectives in terms of um, tenor funds and all of that, if there will be periodic draw of funds from that portfolio. So all of these objectives we put in consideration to provide to you an investment brief. And it is after you have reviewed that investment brief and we have discussed it, then we can now proceed on the investment. All right, thank you very much. I, uh, uh, so I, I, want to, I want to know a follow up. Can I have a number? Are we going to do a video call? Because when we have our meeting, it should be good for everyone to hear this. I mean, this, the, 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 the um, questions you are asking about, I mean, the requirements uh, you're asking about, I think it'll be good for everyone to hear that. Is it possible to have a video call or something when our meeting comes up? Can I get yes, in contact? Yes, we so can that do that. Okay. We can do that. We can reach out to you if you just drop your contact details to the panelists, or we can get your contact details from the stop broken units. We would reach out to you. Someone from our unit will reach out to you. Okay, can... I'll feel the link. I'll feel the link. So I'll be expecting okay. that then. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Andrew. Okay, that's it. That's a great one. So um the next person, the second person that was raising his or her hand, that's um uh, Toby Oladipo. Can we omit Mr. Toby Oladipo now? Yes. Uh, can everyone hear me? Yeah. Good day, Mr. Toby. Good day to you. Uh, so <clears throat> I have, um, it's, it's more like an opinion. And then I want the professionals in the house to sort of um, comment on that opinion. Um, since they are the professionals and they have uh, better insights into the industry. And for me, at least I have some real estate um, in Lagos and particularly around, you know, the Ibejileki uh, axis. And, um, and I've been living in Lagos for uh, a number of years now. And I, I feel that real estate in Lagos 
um, is tending towards caters mostly towards um, the I net worth individual, so the people that are rich. Um, I feel that a working class person, even if you are working and you have a good job, um, where maybe given the current um, salary dynamics in Lagos, especially, and that you're earning more than 80% of the population. Uh, of the working population. So let's say someone that is in their 20, uh, let's say they are 27 and they are earning 400,000 there and they are, they want to invest in real estate. And they are trying, I, I find that most of, you know, the apartments, um, buildings, um, the semi-detached and all those things <clears throat> that comes up in the adverts, you can't um, env envisage someone earning that amount, which is really a good salary given the economic situation in Nigeria and everything, to invest because they start at maybe, they're starting at maybe 10 million and maybe they they give some quasi mortgage that says you are paying thirty you can pay thirty percent or fifty percent and then you know you pay the rest over the next year and when you do the math you see that what they're going to be paying aside that they're going to be paying a lot to start with what they're going to be paying every month um, is so much um, is a high percentage of their salary so. And I also feel that um, the, the real estate landscape in, in Nigeria, especially the Lagos, Abuja, and you know, maybe Port Harcourt, they are overpriced. Um, if you compare what you're getting in the eyebrow and the most coveted areas of um, these cities, with what you will get abroad, it seems to be that you are better investing abroad. So I worked for a number of years where my company was in Banana Island, and you find that Banana Islands where you know the billionaires in Nigeria actually um, have real estate investment or leave. But in terms of infrastructure, in terms of you know aesthetics. If you go outside of the country and you find maybe similar estates where the wealthy class of those um, population live, it's much more aesthetic, it's much more sane, it's much more technologically advanced than, you know, that in Nigeria. And so I, I find that for Nigeria, and this is my opinion, that most real estate, you're not getting the value um, compared to if you take that money and invest elsewhere, you're getting, you're buying a land that is, is, um, is sort of inflated. And I wonder, like I said, I worked, you know, in the Banana Island, Victoria Island for a number of years, is that you see many houses that are, nobody's living in, the, in, in those houses. And, you go to work every day and they are up for rent and they are up for sale and nobody is living there. And we have a, high, um, a housing crisis in, in Nigeria as a whole and most especially in Lagos. And if you go to the other part of the, you know, if you go to Yaba, for example, and there's a house for rent, you find that this is where you would, people have already paid for an apartment before it's completed because that matches the demand, the, the pocket of most um, population of Nigerians. So, the, so I want you to comment on this and maybe also how can we get out of you know this quagmire? How can we? How can our real estate invest, um, sector actually 
uh, develop and serve the needs for the majority of Nigerians. If, you, if you're working in the United States and you have a decent job, you can easily get, um, you can buy a house, pay that mortgage over the course of maybe 20, 30 years. And buying a house in those times is not complicated. Even if you're buying for investment, you can easily buy an apartment building and rent it out. And it's not complicated. And you would see the value for money um, coming through for you. But in many places in Nigeria, it's like the assumption is most properties is like it's for the rich people. Many of them, even the people that are the high middle class, can get into um, those investments. For, for example, in Lagos, if you, I bet that if you're working and you're earning one million naira and you're the major provider for your family, uh, let's say you're married, you're a man, you're married, you have two children, and you're earning one million to 1.5 million naira, you cannot buy a house before, let's say, um, after, um, before moving upwards to Lekki, before Shongotedo, maybe what you can only get is somewhere down, um, somewhere, in, you know, maybe Ibeju, Ibogije, Yaoyaya, or something. You cannot definitely buy anything in Yaba or so the opportunity seems to be limited in terms of what you can get. In other climes, you can invest in an apartment in Manhattan if you, if you, even if it's a little part that you're not buying a whole apartment, but part of that apartment. So I want the professionals to talk to these issues. Um, okay, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Toby. Uh, beautiful insights uh, you are bringing to enrich our conversation. And uh, I think um, a lot of people also have such things go running through their mind. Therefore, I would like Mr. Babajide to uh, briefly speak to this because we are also looking at time. I'm planning to see how we can uh, call it a day. So I would like you to speak to this. Mr. Babajide, you are muted. I want you to unmute yourself. Okay. Uh, Mr. Tuga said a lot of things, but I'll quickly, I quickly—I don't know how to answer the long question in a very short period. But I understand how you feel. But I'll say I'll tell you some three key things that will sum up most of these things. First, when you are going to investment, don't assume that you need to your first house must be where you are going to stay. Because you're buying a house, you have to stay there. Yeah. So there's a Cutting your coat according to your size, according to your, according to your, to your clothes. Now, so if you have one million, you can be sure you buy a house and see the good investment. The only difference is that the more money you put in real estate, the more you spread. That's it. And that so immediately you have that, and real estate is only the is the only investment that can walk to a bank and say, come, come and give me money. Let's do this investment together. But when the return comes, I'll take my thoughts alone and just pay your interest. You can, it, it, that's not as easy for stocks, not for bonds. But let's say to all the, that all, what all the mortgage bank you see on the video society, that's all they do. They are waiting for you to say, bring your closing costs, we'll give you a certain amount of money, we we'll jointly go into it, and we can help it. And you went abroad and say, let me first think the abroad thing. Yes, house may be cheaper, infrastructure may be good, but the level of appreciation in Nigeria is crazy. But you have to understand the market. As I said, real estate is a business that to manage efficiently for you to get returns. So you have to know, am I spending money on real estate? Or am I investing on real estate? So you can go and spend, buy, spend 500 million, Buying the house in banana, yes, it's because you have it, you can spend it, spend it. Just you can spend money anywhere. And can tell you, you can want to go to Yaba and invest in real estate. So you can be shocked that you can, if you make more returns 
that then I invested 500 million. But this pen, are you invested? So our returns in Nigeria, if you know the trends and you follow it very well, the returns are good. Rental income, um, cash flow, good. And you can see even make it liquid. I think Nigerian real estate, if you plan it very well as an investor, Nigerian real estate is as liquid, especially in Lagos. And some areas in Lagos, in the island part of Lagos. And even some part of mainland too are very, very liquid. The structure of things there. And we, we did, if what was out of the market, we did three to four weeks. It is structured very well. And funding are available in the, in, uh, uh, in the mortgage system. Right now, they are liquid. So I think that's, that's what I really capture from what you have said. So don't worry. If people can still invest in us. No matter where you are, start from there. Last, I'll give one scenario. The so called real estate syndication, whereby more than one person own a house. And there's somebody called an arranger. So we do that a lot in my congratulations at our school. We arrange, we bring people together and they join their own property and they make returns. So now there's no pride. They cannot say you own any house, but you get your rent, the rent is paid, your own part of the rent gets, gets to you. So if you are basically going for real estate for investment purpose, which is what we are discussing here majorly, you don't need to live in that house. So if you if your standard is living in banana because you work there, but you cannot afford it. But you don't, I'll be sure if you work banana like you to afford the house in the meter. Yeah, or in country. And you'll be shocked that the rent there are very good. And when you want to say you still have, it's still appreciate. And you can join the buy with people, but I can tell you the option in Nigeria is very good. So far, you can afford education or foreign exchange in case you are going to be moving your money outside the country. I think I, 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 I hope I answered the question a bit. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Maybe the other one would be like, would you, in terms of the real estate market, how much is that? you know, answering, especially like in Lagos, in Lagos, for example, where there's overpopulation and, you know, there's scarcity of where to descend housing. Do you see the development um, maybe in the next few years um, solving this problem to a large extent? No, you see, uh, right now, Lagos City is recruiting a CEO of a big Lagos. That's one thing you know. Lagos City are trying to regulate real estate. They won a court judgment on March 22nd over the Nigeria Services of yours and the Esther board, saying that they have right to manage real estate in Lagos. And um, uh, Lagos, Lagos is one of the city marked by Akofala Foundation to help them in their resilience as they become a mega city. So Lagos actually has a lot of prospect internationally with the interest of uh, Akofala. Lagos itself are trying to regulate yeah, they've got it from those what the developers should not be an agent and all this stuff. And they also the building control is very effective. So there's a lot of potential in Lagos that will give good results. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Um, um thank you, uh, Mr. Toby and Mr. Babajide. So at this point in time, we'll be uh, trying to see how we can close this um, session for today. I believe um, our conversations have been quite rich and um, we had a wonderful time. A lot of things have been learned here. Personally, I've added knowledge to my knowledge bank. And I believe a lot of, most of the attend attendees today, our participants in this uh, webinar have similar experience or yeah, similar experience today. But before we go, I would want the panelists to just share with us briefly their last thoughts, maybe general advice for people who are here and what you think um, all of us here can do better in the future to maximize value in the real estate um, that sector. Mrs. Tosin, please. I would like you to just share briefly your thoughts, your final thoughts. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you again, Mary Stem, for this invitation. Thank you for having me. Um, on a final note, I'll just like to mention that there is a lot of innovation happening 
in the real estate sector, especially in the prop tech space. Um, gone are the days when real estate was primarily driven by brick and mortar conversations. There is now, you know, different dimensions and different ways to have exposure to real estate assets. There are spin-off services. There are spin-off um, opportunities within the sector. And the prop tech sector is budding just the same way that you have a lot of activity happening in the happening in the in the fintech space so people should keep their um their eyes and ears open to trends innovation in that space there is a concept that is called real estate as a service now where you know principally we are driving you know um, value creation in the real estate space from the perspective of a service where you can you know get value from this asset class without necessarily having any direct exposure to the brick and mortar real estate. We have firms like Mary Stem and several other people that are creating create, uh, creative instruments that allow you access to you know, returns and all of that. We have a lot of um, innovative products that are coming from the, from the technology space. Um, so if you are you know, interested in, in this sector and you're looking at you know, investment, you need to consistently you know, follow the trends. You need to consistently follow the trends. If you are one that is um, a first time you know, um, um, in, um, investor looking to have you know, exposure you know, to this asset class, there are many, many diverse ways that you can do it now, even without owning one piece of, um, of real estate. So I think, I think that would be my part in line. This is the only you know, market where the principle is buyer beware. You have a higher level of, um, of um, care that you need to take if you are, you know, playing or operating in this space much more than any other, any other um, asset class. Um, and then finally, across the world, you cannot cross that barrier of um, wealth without exposure to real estate. Real estate is resilient. Real estate is one of those assets that helps you, you know, primarily hedge against inflation. It is one of the, you know, ways that um, wealth or affluence is measured. So everyone needs to, you know, be inching, you know, to have, you know, some measure of exposure to this asset class. But please do it diligently, please do it carefully. Please, you know, seek advice where you need to have sufficient information before you make investment decisions in this space. There are as many ways to get your hands burnt as there are opportunities. So um, happy investing and all the very best. Uh, thank you so much, Mrs. Joseph. Thank you so much. Um, I also want to uh, inform those of us, I, I know that there are some participants here who are participating from different parts of the world, um, from America, Britain, and the rest of it. You can let us know so that we can provide you the link to this um, video in case you didn't join on time, or in case you want to share with other people, you can indicate interest in the, in the question and uh, answer uh, room so that we can, let, we can send you this, um, recordings. Another thing is, if you really want to reach out to us, if you want to reach out to us, that's for participants here who want to reach out to us for further clarifications, or for maybe for other services that they might be needing from us, you can reach out to us by sending a mail to real, to real estate at maristemng.com. Real estate at maristemng.com. I think- Wealth real estate at maristemng.com. What? Wealth real estate at maristemng.com. Okay, wealth real estate at maristemng.com. So we can equally, if you want to see, see it fully um, written, you can go and you can check in the chat room or in the question and answer comment. One of us will be writing it down there. You can copy it and send us a mail. We'll be ready to um, advance this conversation with you. And for those of us who live abroad, too, in case you have real estate 
here in Nigeria or you inherited some properties in Nigeria, it's been run down or you don't want them to run it down, you want it to be properly managed, we are here for you as um, a team. Our real estate management team, we, are, we, are, we help diaspora clients, mostly diaspora Nigerian, uh, diaspora Nigeria to manage their real estate here in Nigeria and give you reports all the time. So um, uh, let me uh, move to Mr. Babajide. Please, can we have your final thoughts for today as we begin to wrap up? Thank you. Uh, I think it's almost time. I'll just quickly say, first thing first, real estate is still one of the most profitable investments you can have. It is still also very risky, but it gives an equal return uh, to us, to, to the investor. I just get good advice. I, I share my job with my We do a lot of things together. They are diligent. I can always support for their uh, professionalism, integrity, and um, vast access to a lot of information, which I think is key here. I think Nigeria is going to be a hub whereby people, whether non Nigeria, Nigeria will be invested in Nigeria, will get returns in the future. NMRC are working with a lot of state governments to review and reform their uh, land law, mortgage laws in different parts of the country. And I think we'll see the real estate give the kind of returns we want very soon. As, uh, and I always tell people, the last I said, when it comes to real estate investment, don't always assume you have to live in the house. Just look at the numbers. Let's focus on the numbers. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much. You. Very insightful. I like that. Thank you so much. So at this point, I want um, uh, Kemi to come up and help us um, close this session. But before then, I also want to thank our panelists and all the participants. So Kemi, you have the floor, please. Thank you, George. Thank you, George. Um, thank you Mr. Kusaga. Thank you, Ms. Mrs. Ajose. And thank you to all the attendees. Um, as we earlier mentioned, we've, we've spoken about the services that Maristem, the real estate unit of Maristem would offer you. And by virtue of being a one-stop shop, we can cater to several other areas in your investments. We have our capital, we have our trustees for people who are concerned with transfer and estate planning. We also have our registrars and COVID services as well. We also have Maristem stockbrokers. We have Maristem Wealth Management who would also um, serve as advisors to you in the area of all of your investments. Thank you very much. We hope that you have been thoroughly informed and we hope that there are certain misconceptions that you previously had that have now been cleared. Thank you once again and thank you for attending. You've reached the stars. Now let's see you conquer galaxies. The storm is over. Is it? Is it ever over? Storms are part of life. They come and go. The plan is to build your wealth, to withstand stormy days. And to do that, you need partners. Partners that understand what it means to build wealth that lasts. Meristam, let's grow wealth for you.